on hack. It's Paul Henning, who's going to do two talks, one about his new house and one about the ESO telescope project. Let's give a round of applause for Paul Henning. You should hold that on till I'm done. Um, in 2012, we did a prototype for ESO, the European Southern Observatory, um, for adaptive optics for large telescopes. Traditional uh, adaptive optics have been racks full of DSPs and FPGAs and stuff like that. And then five years later, the company that did it doesn't exist anymore, and 10 years later, they can't get spare parts. So they wanted to try to do it on regular computers, come on off-the-shelf computers. Uh, we just won a second round of this. Now we have to build the real thing. Um, so this is a little bit of uh, a talk about what the ESO ELT is, what adaptive optics is, and what we're doing about it. So this is actually Newton's first mirror telescope. Um, the movie there is a professor from Nottingham University who has a series of periodic videos about the periodic system. Because the mirror is actually not glass, it's a speculum, a particular metal alloy. Um, the interesting thing here is this telescope is five centimeters diameter, two inches. Um, William Herschel started making bigger mirrors because bigger mirrors means you get more photons, which means you can see more things. And we've been building larger mirrors ever since. Um, this is the state of the art at this point. This is the 8.2 meter telescope or mirror for, for the VLT telescopes ESO built in Chile. They built four of them to try to do interferometry using the light from all four telescopes. You get a virtual telescope and stuff. That took 25 years to get that to work. But uh, this is about as large a mirror as you can do in one piece. If you try to make a mirror that's larger than eight meters in diameter, it kind of gets wonky on you. And eight meters is, I guess this tent is probably 10 meters across. So we're talking really big slabs of glass here. So what ESA wants to do now is build the really large telescope. The original project was called OWL, the overwhelmingly large telescope. And that was supposed to be 100 meters in diameter, which is sort of like a soccer field. Um, they did the math and found out that we have to build it from something we don't know what is, because not even carbon fiber would be able to hold a mirror like that, stable to within a couple of wavelengths um, as it turns to follow uh, objects in the sky. So they downsized the project to 42 meters, because this was really a telescope about finding planets, livable planets. So this is about life, the universe, and everything. So 42 meters sounded right. Um, and the cost came out around 2 billion euros. And they were told, no way. So they cut about a billion mirror, uh, euros from it, cut it in half, and they end up with a diameter of 39 meters. This will be a segmented mirror, and there's a mug-up on the grass there. It will consist of close to a thousand mirror segments, each about a meter all tracking the same direction. If you point this telescope at the sun, you get one megawatt of sun energy, which means that your secondary mirror is gone. So don't do that. Um, ESO has used, as a matter of principle, about 10% of their budgets for prototyping. So there's around 100 million euros used on prototyping this thing. Uh, these are some of the prototypes. The yellow thing behind there is actually one of the segment holders that will hold probably in the end seven segments of the main mirror in one unit like that. Uh, the one here in front is the uh, tip tilt mirror. It can move in two directions to take the global corrections of, of the uh, wave front out. It's also a very high quality subwoofer as it goes to close to a megahertz. Um, but you have to stand right at the right place to hear it, otherwise it's kind of funky. So we did this prototype in 2012, where we take 10,000 floating point numbers, multiply them by a registration matrix, which is also 10,000, then multiply it by a projection matrix, and then we get 6,300 
floating point numbers out that's used to correct all these mirrors. And the footnote about this is we have to do it 500 times a second with very low jitter, 20 microseconds jitter on the packet we send out. Um, and we did that on a cluster of Dell computers, um, 56 core uh, Optron machines. Um, and we did it well inside specification. So it's possible to do this. So um, foundations are the lowest part of a building, and they're making the foundations for the telescope now um, on top of a mountain, which is sort of ironic, I think. Um, but what is all this adaptive optic stuff? So photons are weird. We used to think about photons as this particle that runs in a straight line, but that's actually not what's happening. If you put up two microwave antennas, you need a, a volume of space. It's not just enough to have line of sight. A, a, a tree that does nowhere get near your line of sight can still severely impact your transmission because the actual electrons of your, or the electromagnetic field of your, your transmission uh, takes up what's called the Fresnel uh, volume. And you can calculate that. So the interesting thing about this is if we start out with a a mirror of size one, then we're doing a windowing effect on the incoming wavefront, which means we get all these artifacts, first order, second order, third order. So if we make it twice as big, the frequency increases as well of these. And that's why the larger your telescope, the sharper your image is. So a larger telescope can see smaller features out in space. So if you want to see a planet next to a star, you want a really large mirror. That's the basic physics of this. Um, if your mirror has a secondary structure sitting in here, then you get different, it's, it's kind of hard to see it, but you get different disturbances in your wavefront. If your mirror is, is not round, you get spikes. If you have a segmented mirror, things get really weird. So, um, Getting as sharp as an image as possible is not as simple as one would think. But the other problem is that between the mirror and the star we're looking at is a lot of air moving around. And if your telescope is two inches, you're looking through a pretty homogeneous slice of, of air out there. But once your mirror is 39 meters in diameter, you have turbulence inside the this, this cylinder of, of uh, air you're seeing light go through. And that's basically why we see stars sparkle. We see a star flickering around, and that's the air moving the image of, of the star around because the air has different densities and stuff like that. So if you take a short exposure, you get this kind of speckled image. If you take a long exposure, you get this kind of woozy things. But if things were perfect, you would get a dot. Adaptive optics is about getting that dot instead. So the thing you do is you have a wavefront coming in from the star. You have a mirror you can bend. You split some of the light out to what's called a wavefront sensor. Then you figure out how disturbed is the, light, uh, the wavefront here. Then you bend the mirror to correct for that. And then your science instrument will get a perfect uh, image. Um, that's the deformable mirror for the ELT telescope prototype. So it's a very, very thin mirror with 4,000 actuators that can pull or push a few wavelengths on the glass. So the glass can be pretty much any shape you want it to be to compensate for the incoming wavefront. The, they installed adaptive optics on the VLT-4 telescope in Chile, the 8-meter telescope. And this is with an, a Neptune with and without adaptive optics. This is the kind of difference we're talking about. The ELT telescope, being four times larger, will basically be useless without adaptive optics. It will just be one fuzzy thing you see. Um, so it's, it's very important there. The interesting thing about this one is, this is Neptune seen from the ground with adaptive optics, and that's seen from the Hubble telescope. We're basically compensating out the entire atmosphere disturbance. And since the mirror is larger, we get better resolution. 
So the wavefront sensor is this weird kind of thing where you have a lens slit array, simply an array of a lot of small lenses. And then when you put that slightly out of the focal plane and project it, you get an image that shows how the wavefront is disturbed for each part of the main mirror. So um, the red dot here says that at this place on the main mirror, the wavefront is disturbed this direction. So you get an X and a Y coordinate for all these points. And then from that, you have to figure out how to bend the mirror in the other end. And that's the math we're supposed to calculate or, or perform. We're not uh, coming up with all the uh, coefficients. The last thing missing is that you need your wavefront sensor to look at a guide star. And if you can use a natural guide star, that's obviously best. But it has to be pretty close to a science field, and that's not always the case. So they've come up with shooting lasers into the sodium layer. It's not actually a layer. It's just about 10 kilometers in the upper atmosphere where there is some sodium. And if you hit that with the right wavelength, it lights back. So you can make an artificial star that way. And that's why many pictures of modern telescopes, you have these lasers shooting out of them to, uh, to, to generate artificial stars. And sometimes they get a phone call to turn the laser off now, because there's something out there that doesn't want to look into it. And they get told, turn it off for seven and a half minutes, and they turn it off for seven and a half minutes, and nobody gets mad about anything. Um, it's pretty strong lasers, all things considered. So the thing we're supposed to do is we're supposed to take six wavefront sensors, which takes 800 by 800 pixel images 500 times a second in 16-bit resolution, black and white, and do 700 gigaflops of calculations on them and send the results out to four deformable mirrors, which will bend the wavefront into shape. And we're supposed to tell them what goes on inside it to the tune of three and a half gigabit uh, telemetry along the way. And this is basically supposed to be a Lego brick tool they can use to build the telescope and the instruments that go with it. And everything in this is a parameter, which is a neat little thing. So the limiting factor for us is the memory bandwidth. Um, the level cache, three caches are not big enough to hold these huge matrices that we're multiplying. Um, not quite. In a couple of years' time, we'll probably see chips with level three caches that can do this in cache. And then they can just buy a new Dell server and put it in and run even faster if they want. So the hardware criteria for us is the number of memory buses, which means that we're looking at the AMD EPIC chip. And that's a really interesting chip. Um, we have a, a machine right now with two sockets, 64 cores, and 16 memory buses. Um, somebody released a benchmark on his blog a couple of days ago uh, where they had an EPIC server and they tried to run it and it was like 30% faster than a comparable Intel machine. And that's basically because they have twice the number of memory buses. But um, this is actually a very beautiful design. Um, AMD's Project C is one chip and they have like 66 uh, products coming out of it. And there's the, I think they added a couple this week too. So the EPIC, the thread rib of the Ryzen, they're all the same chip, the Sebelin chip. And they can sell chips even though most of it doesn't work actually. They have a very long list of, of units. At the top end, you have four perfect chips in a single socket. That's the EPIC 7601. It costs $4,000. You get 64 threads, 32 cores, eight memory buses. Um, and two sockets. Then you have seven other dual socket products, and then they have the lowest dual socket where you have four of these chips with a lot of defect cores. So you only get 16 threads, eight cores. That's a quarter of the number of cores. You still get eight memory buses, and you can get it for $475. That's a very interesting machine. It has a lot of memory bandwidth, and it's very cheap. So then we get to single socket systems. So you have four almost perfect chips. The only thing that doesn't work is the buses to connect them together in a dual socket system. $4,000 again. It ought to be 4100 maybe. Then there's 55 other products. And then you have the bottom line where you have a really rubbish chip, which they sell for $109. 
most of that chip doesn't work, but you get, you know, four cores, four threads, two memory buses. So I tried to map out, this is the Sebelin chip. The black bits can be defect and they can still sell a product. That's really good design. It's more than 50% of the area can be defect and they still have a $100 pr uh, product. So um, AMD is going to clean Intel's clock for a, until they usually shoot themselves in the foot. That's how AMD does it. Um, that's a very interesting design. But then you start reading the hardware specs really carefully and it says this machine can only operate up to 10,000 feet. And it's like, how tall was that mountain? Oops. So have you ever heard about extreme Wikipedia editing? <laughs> this is how you edit Wikipedia. <laughs> So as long as they install the computers at the ground floor, we're fine. Um, Frederick P. Brooks in the Mythical Man Month wrote that writing a program, if we set that to effort one, you write a program to do something for yourself. One effort. If you want to make it a product, you have to document it and you probably have to fix some of the bugs. So that's three times as much work. If you want to make it a systems programming product, which is it's a kind of old term, but what he means is a configurable program product. Add another factor of three on top of it. And then if you want to make it international so it can talk Japanese, another times three. Portable, secure, user-friendly, multiply by three each time. So um, in this case, everything is a parameter. So we're coming down here. To, uh, to make this possible for everything to be a parameter. How many wavefront sensors? That's a parameter. How big are they? That's a parameter. How many mirrors? That's a parameter. Um, so writing code that handles dynamic sizing, we've done that for ages. And that code is where we find most of the programming box and most of the security issues. Buffer overflows, just for the most trivial one of them. Um, we have some very large parameters. Um, the control matrix, the largest one, is 230 megabytes, and it can change once per minute. Um, and we have to inject this 230 megabyte thing into this tightly choreographed real-time system that runs 500 or maybe 700 times a second. Um, we have also some that changes every work cycle. That's simply a real-time disturbance that gets sent in for, for calibration purposes and stuff. And some of the static parameters have really heavy implications for the sequence in which we can do the operations. Um, the order we get the pixels from the camera determines the order we can start the calculations, the sooner we can be done, and so on. Um, and yeah, an 800 by 800 camera, that's not really anything these days, is it? Except it takes 700 frames per second, progressive readout, and has a, di a direct digital readout. It doesn't come out with an analog signal that somebody digitizes. It comes out digital on the fly, and the noise is about three electrons per pixel, which means there's no noise, and has 90% quantum efficiency, which means it gets all the electrons you basically can get. One of the things I found interesting about it is that they read it out in parallel, so they have a lot of AD converters. How did they do that? And that's a really neat trick. So. The signal comes from the optical part here. They have a preamplifier, then they have a comparator. This is each pixel column. So they have this ramp signal coming in, one single ramp signal that goes to all the, the pixel columns. And then they have a gray code that corresponds to the ramp. So whenever the ramp crosses the signal here, they latch the gray code. A gray code is like a binary code, only there's only one bit that changes at a time. So you don't have any when you change from 7F to 8.0, you would have all eight bits changing in a byte. And getting all of those to change at the same time is very hard. In the gray code, only one bit changes at a time. So it's always stable that way. But basically that way, they can 
do a AD conversion on 400 pixels at a time in parallel and ship them out serial as bits at, at full speed. That's really brilliant thinking here. Um, and this is, the, um, this is what they dream about. The one they're talking about here is um, not the one they're going to use in the first generation instruments, but that will be what we see in the next generation. And that's four times the number of pixels we're looking at now. But basically, they built this chip, the NGS chip, which is one quarter of it. And then the plan is to just build four of those and fit them together in, in, um, in, the, in, the, in the focal plane of the instrument. Um, our current evil idea is that we'll take all the static parameters into a Python program and have that program spit out C code instead of having the C code dynamically size. We can size all the arrays statically at compile time, let the compiler deal with them and optimize them. And there won't be a configuration file, there'll be a Python program, which is the configuration file. So for instance, you want to load this map from a, a FITS file, you load it from a FITS file. But this is a Python program, so you could also have a loop that sets up an array in some systematic way and so on. Um, we suspect this might be a hard sell, but we plan to sell it anyway. It's not the way they used to think at ESO. Um, we think of it as just-in-time compilation. It's not just-in-time the way we do it with, with uh, Java computers and uh, Java uh, virtual machines and stuff like that. But at the startup time, we generate code we're going to run. And some of you will know that this idea has been exploited in Varnish. The Varnish configuration file is compiled to a C program, which is compiled to a shared library, which is loaded in and executed at machine speed. And that's where we got the idea, basically. Um, but there's a lot of advantages for us here. We have to write a ton of test files. And normally, you would, you'd write a program to, to create the test file, and then you have version control on the program and on the test file, and blah, blah, blah. In this case, we just have the Python program that generates the test data and version control on that, and we're done. Um, we may even be able to do a Python version of the numerical model and use that for fuzzing tests, send this, the same input to the Python code and to the real code, and see if we get the same results out at the end. Within, the Python code will, will be using uh, doubles, whereas the, the real code will use only use floats. So there'll be some routing effects we'll have to look at, but we'll, we'll see if that works out. So that was the ESO ELT project. Any questions? Thank you. Um, when you take the light off in the ELT to assess how, how to deform the mirror, how much, what fraction of the signal do you, do you siphon so, off that way? So that illustration I used here is, is not the way they're going to do it in this case. Um, this is, when you go to the optician to have your, your eyes measured, you're actually looking into one of these wavefront sensors. And that's the way they do it with a, a half silhouette mirror. Um, in the in the LT and, and generally in astronomic, uh, astronomical telescopes, what they do is you have a science field, and then you have a periphery, and you'll use the periphery for the adaptive optic sensors. So the, you have these sort of robot mechanisms that can, in a polar coordinate system, put the sensor where the light is, so to speak. Um, and usually the the science instruments will be designed. Either to not either either to only use the central part of the scope, or to accept that there will be these devices sticking into the edge, and and you'll have to deal with that in in the science planning. There's a very heavy duty application running to schedule uh, observations because you have a lot of constraints. Um, some things have to be observed at a particular period of some binary star or whatever. Um, you cannot put the telescope so that if something breaks down, the sun will come across the focus within at least 12 hours, preferably more. 
um, lots, lots of constraints uh, that way, and, and the adaptive optics shading is one of them. Um, that adaptive optics is, is, is possible and that it doesn't shade the science target and stuff like that. Um, and of course, all the astronomers think that their particular observation has priority zero, um, which is a major part of the, the application. This one, no, no. So the, the Python program generates the C program, which is the 200 something megabyte of parameters? No, no the, the parameters are transferred uh, as UDP packets, but there, there's uh, the static parameters, which will not change while we're running. And that would, for instance, be the number of wavefront sensors and how large they are or how many mirrors are active in this configuration, stuff like that. And that's what the Python program takes in and compiles a version or generates parts of the C code, compiles the entire thing to give a application that's optimized for this configuration. And how big is that C code, roughly? Uh, I think the, the last prototype we did was around 100,000 lines in total, including test harnesses and stuff. And we don't expect this to be particularly much larger because we use the Python code to take a lot of the if-diffing out of it. And it's, it's not so time critical because it's at startup. That's only startup, yeah. So 10 seconds, fine. Yeah. I mean, it, starting an observation on a telescope of this class will probably take close to 10 minutes uh, between getting it into position, getting it stabilized, getting it locked, getting instruments and so on. On the VLT, I think they, on, they, they can... Um, Rapid fire observations they can do in something like seven minutes, excluding the slew time to move the telescope over there. Um, but it will be more on this one because simply moving the entire telescope, you'll have to wait for it to stop wobbling. It's a very large structure. Yeah, yeah so the, the concept of uh, uh, compiling just in time, I, I've also seen that in, with uh, TCC by Fabrice Bellard. Yeah. yeah. So you did a fun demo of that with the kernel. Yeah. But it's, it's, um, I expect we'll have some comments on this from ESO on Wednesday because um, we kind of hinted to them early that we'll come up with a proposal doing it this way and there were some what kind of reactions. So we expect that some people have, have gotten their knickers in a twist about it. But we think it's the right way to do it in this case because what they want... So part of this is that they have the telescope and then they have the instruments. And the instruments will change over the lifetime of the telescope. The, the VLT telescope is on the third generation instruments now. Um, and part of the adaptive optics is in the instrument. So they don't want to have to start from scratch every time they plan a new instrument. They want something like, OK, this instrument has these parameters. Here's a file, run. Um, and we think doing the Python thing is, is the right way to attack that problem, to get maximum software quality out of it. And it's there is prior art, so it's not like an exotic. No, 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 thing, not at right? all, not at all. Uh, so this is a very latency-sensitive problem, right? Yeah, this is basically a feedback loop. Yeah. Um, so, so how do you get data into your Dell computers fast enough? Uh, one ten gigabit. Ethernet. Ethernet from mm -hmm. each wavefront sensor. And it's basically chock full of packets. I think they're using something like 60-70% of the bandwidth for, for each wavefront sensor. All right. Okay. So the other half talk I brought is about the house I built. Um, we had the lock that a plot of land across the street came up for sale from a uh, bankrupt developer. Um, a quite large plot of land, quite cheaply. And um, we bought that in 2012, and uh, then we built a house on it. And this is, a little bit, this is probably most relevant for Danes, but uh, the experience of building a house as a nerd. Um, so one of the first things that's interesting is we have all these open uh, geodata in Denmark, which you can use to find out if you actually built the house the place you thought you built it. Um, this is the latest uh, um, 
autophoto images from, from this spring. And um, it's taken from a slight angle, but it looks like the house is basically where it's supposed to be under the white line. Um, I use these geodata images quite a lot during the planning and, and stuff like that. Um, I can highly recommend to play with them. That's a lot of fun. Um, this house is built to the Danish Building Code 2020, which means it should basically not use energy under normal circumstances. Um, it looks like our heating bill will be around four and a half thousand kilowatt hours per year. And this is a plot I did where I have the outside temperature on the x-axis and the number of kilowatt hours per day we used. And we get a pretty good correlation that says we're using 1.3 kilowatt hours per day for heating for every degree we have to heat the house. That's actually pretty amazing considering that this is a house where people open the doors and take showers and stuff like that. Um, the the, day, the uh, 20 building code in Denmark is pretty highly insulated. You end up with exterior walls that's half a meter thick, which gives a lot of place in the windows for, for plants. Um, but it actually works out. You basically don't use any heat in the house at the end of the day. Um, this is an expense of around 4,000 krona a year at the current rate of electricity for electrical heating houses. This is a, a, a ground heating system. Um, if I look at, at what we use our power for, um, first we have put solar panels on the roof, uh, a three kilowatt system, which my I've, I've been monitoring our electricity use for a lot of years, so I had a lot of data to simulate with. And I found out that the, hot spot, uh, the, the, the sweet spot would be around 2,400 kilowatt, uh, 2.4 kilowatt uh, solar panels. So I rounded it up a bit to have a, a margin for adding air condition to global heating later on. Um, so um, we used a little more than half of the solar energy you, uh, we produced, the rest was sold back to the grid. Um, and this is including my company that runs a bunch of computers and network and electronics constantly. Uh, for a normal household, you would probably only use about a quarter of the solar power you generate inside the house. The rest will go into the grid. Because basically, when the sun shines in Denmark, you're at work. And when you run the dishwasher and the dryer and the washing machine and stuff like that, it's dark outside. So um, solar cells is a really good idea, but don't expect to use electricity yourself. And no, I couldn't find out, I couldn't get batteries to make sense. I did a lot of math on batteries, it doesn't make sense. Electricity is too cheap and the feed-in rate is too good in Denmark for that to make any sense. Um, it will change as, as the price of batteries come down, but at this point, no, it doesn't make sense. So this is, um, this is what we actually use the electricity for. So the ground uh, water heating system uses the largest majority of it. And my company uses quite a lot of power also. Uh, this is the cooling unit in, in, the, uh, in, in my company. So one of the disadvantages of having a new house that's well insulated is you cannot find a cupboard somewhere and stick a server in it. Trust me on this. It won't work. It will get very hot. Um, a, a room two by two meters will take two watts to heat one degree. So if you stick a server in there with 120 degrees, it will get hot. Very hot. So I have a cooling, a cooling unit in my company. Otherwise, I couldn't run anything. Uh, and that's a 16 square meter room. And it would just get too hot without a cooling unit. Um, if we take the uh, company out of the picture, um, it looks slightly different. Um, so this is the light, general whatever we plug into the outlets in the house. Um, this is the kitchen. This is the, the uh, washing machine, the dryer, and the um, uh, dishwasher machine. 
And the last one is the um, stove top where you cook your food. Um, so it seems like uh, sort of a 50-50 thing there. Um, and then I have a, um, a quiz. So we wanted to get internet. And there's about 200 meters from the public road to our house. So I called the antenna company and said, that will cost 19,000 kroner. And I called the phone company and they said, it will cost 30,000 kroner. And I told them, and put up my own cabinet next to the road. And we run a 10 pair of uh, telephone cable, a half inch coax cable, and 12 fibers down to the house. Um, that cost me total of 9,000 kroner for all of it, including the cabinet. And then I called the phone company and said, I want an XDSL in that cabinet. And that cable is literally there. This is where the cable is. And they said, well, that will cost you 12,000 kroner. So since my wife works for Copenhagen University, she has an employer-paid uh, internet connection. She's a system administrator in the ancient DNA um, bioinformatics group. So we ended up with two cable modem. But that shouldn't be a problem, should it? So we have the, uh, the stove net here. We have one modem. We have another modem. Then bridge mode, of course. We do our own firewalls. We have a switch, two VLANs through the fiber, two firewalls. Piece of cake. Or so I thought. So, if we ping from, say, Copenhagen University to my wife's firewall, we have no packet loss. If we ping from her firewall to the exact same machine at Copenhagen University, we have 50 plus percent packet loss. Your task is to explain this while I give, go through the rest of the slides. So one of my, uh, my products right now is that we ordered all the windows and doors with uh, magnetic contacts so you can see if they're open or closed. Because I want a little light next to my front door that says, oh, you have an open window. So I know that I'll remember to close it before I leave the house. So I have all these contacts throughout the house, and they come up under the attic, and they're connected in one long serious connection. So the idea is, at room number one, we'll put a resistor across all the, the switches in that room, another resistor for the next room, and so on. And so measure the resistance, and then be able to tell what rooms have open windows. So the task here is to find 13 resistors that allows us to tell all the rooms apart, single, and preferably also two different rooms. Um, and by optimal, I mean the cheapest possible measurement of the resistance. Um, in total, there are 169 combinations. And by optimal, I mean the two largest resistances I have to measure, divided by the smallest difference I have to measure, is uh, as small as possible. And I thought, that's a, ma a small matter of programming, right? And started a computer counting. And um, remember that dual socket EPIC I told you about? It's been added for a month. <laughs> this is a, a variation of the knapsack problem that explodes very badly. Um, but I have my solution now. Um, but it's a, it's a nice um, little misestimation uh, on my side how large this task actually was to calculate. Um, I didn't bring the gadget I wanted to show here. I'm sorry about that. I came out of bed at quarter to four this morning. I'm immensely proud I remembered to bring my passport. So um, in the Department of Random Observation, a house built according to the new Danish building code is very quiet. All this thermal insulation also insulates from sound. Um, 
we have built our house a little bit more solid than you'd normally do it because we have the railroad running about 60 meters behind the house, the main railroad through, uh, through Denmark. Um, but I hadn't expected to have to pay attention to how much the fridge would generate noise. Um, I should have done that because that is actually the most noisy thing in our living room is the fridge which gargles and bubbles and burbles and whatever it does and we bought a 43 decibel fridge it's like whatever right no we should have gone for low noise um that's one thing i hadn't expected to see um we also put the uh, the washing machine and the dryer a little bit too close to the living quarters they're even more noisy um, that, that was one of the things that blindsided me. Um, the other thing is that we'll have to start building active cooling in Denmark. We just had a wonderful heat wave to, to demonstrate the fact. Um, thermal insulation works both ways, which means that once your house gets too hot, it stays too hot. Um, we use what's called energy windows in Denmark. They let visible light in and out, but infrared radiation cannot get out, which means when the sunlight comes in, if it hits something white and gets reflected out, that's fine. If it hits something dark and gets converted to heat, your living room gets 26 degrees hot in a matter of days. And we, went, we moved out to the beach house without drawing the curtains. That was, that was a mistake. <clears throat> In the future, we will need air conditioning in houses in Denmark. We should plan that in the building code at this point. Uh, <clears throat> cooling uh, using the floors is very problematic in Denmark because of the humidity. You will almost, by guarantee, get condensate, which is not good for wooden floors. We build our house with what's called heavy uh, interior walls. It's um, it's light concrete, which is about half the density of normal concrete. Um, <clears throat> that helps smooth out the temperature over the day, um, but not really long range, doesn't do that much there. Um, this is the uh, ventilation system. Um, there's a um, heat exchange on the ventilation system, which means it can actually actively cool the air and heat the air. Um, when it's too hot inside and the outside air is even hotter, the heat exchange means that the air you blow out will cool down the air you blow in to not heat the house more than necessary. In the winter, it's the other way around. But um, you can also have a bypass where you couple the, the heat exchanger out so that on a summer night when the air outside is cool, you can blow that cool air directly into the house to cool the house down. Um, and this brings us to the intelligent house. Everybody will try to sell you intelligent house ventilation, heat pumps, switches, doorknobs. It's all crap. None of it talks to each other. And none of it has the control option as you will want. Um, I was surprised how crabby all that stuff was. The heat pump came with an internet attachment unit and there was four screws, so I unscrewed them, and there was a Texas Instruments evaluation kit inside the box. I was like, I don't want this. Um, the intelligent house doesn't exist at this point in time. Um, I would drop all IoT options. It's all crap. All the stuff I've seen in relation to this house building project has been crap. And some of it has been really, really crap. Um, I insisted on getting Modbus RS-485 communication on everything. The heat pump, the ventilation, um, the floor heating system control. Uh, I put up a lot of electricity meters with Modbus also. And then I rolled my own control of it. Um, none of the other stuff coordinates in any way. You cannot do that. Um, so, if you're thinking about building a house in Denmark, 
my first advice would be don't. Um, most of the houses we build right now will not last more than 30 or 50 years. And that's not very ecological. Uh, the way we build houses right now is pretty shitty. Um, they are generally, they will, they will generally have thermal problems in a hotter climate. They're not built to have air condition, and they're not built so you can add air condition later on. Um, and there's a very strict focus on, air, on energy use, which is wrong because we have to start looking at where the energy comes from. Wasting energy from solar panels is fine. Nobody dies because you waste energy from solar panels. We have to look at what kind of energy, when do we use it, what do we use it for. Um, and and in, at least in Denmark, we have this very big focus that wasting energy is like, oh, the eighth deathly sin, right? Wasting energy. We have to save energy at any cost. And it's, it's simply not true. If my solar panels are up there and I waste some of that energy, too bad. There's no cost associated with that. So if you want to buy, build a house and you insist on building a house, uh, Tübehuse, as we call them in Denmark, standard houses, they're very marginal, very unflexible discount goods. What you will see is always the minimal, minimum viable product. The shittiest house they can offer people to live in, and then you'll have to add 10 to 15% to that to get a reasonable house. And you'll still end up with a pretty shitty const uh, uh, construction at the end of the day. Um, many of these houses, you cannot add another doorway in them. You cannot remove any of the interior walls. They're all part of the stabilization of the house. In one of the ones I looked at, the, the walkway on the attic was part of the stabilization of the house. They really optimized. They, we're talking highly optimized industrial products. They've cut everything away they can cut away to cut the price down. And there's a lot of plastics in them, untested plastics. We don't know what the lifetime will be, but a good guess is 30 to 40 years, and none of them are easy to change at that point. You will have plastic under your concrete floor. There's no way to upgrade it, change it. Um, the the um, air tightness barrier is plastic. You can probably change that by tearing down all the ceilings. Maybe also all the interior walls, depending on the construction. Um, and there's still a lot of, ooh, we didn't think about that kind of mistakes in modern house building in Denmark. Um, we've always said in Denmark that you have to bury something where it doesn't freeze 120 centimeters, except if it's a heated construction, 90 centimeters fine. And heated constructions would be the foundations of a house because they were not insulated. Well, guess what? Now they are, which means that 90 centimeters is not enough foundation for a new house in Denmark. You have to dig it into 120 centimeters. And there's still people doing 90 centimeters foundations in Denmark because they haven't thought about this yet. Um, I was kind of dismayed about the amount of do as we usually do in, in this. Um, then you can take a, a model house and upgrade it, but it's not worth the money. Most of the upgrades you can have is finish. Nicer tiles, gold-plated faucets, uh, whatever, downlight spots in the uh, cupboards, stuff like that. But the basic physics of the, the house is still the same shit. The shell we built to live in is, is not worth it. These upgrades are known in the business as the wife bonus. Right? So the man decides that we'll go with this company and take this model. And then the wife comes in and says, I want these nicer tiles, and I want these. And if she's pregnant, it's even better. Right? Um, if you want to build a custom house that's more expensive, doesn't have to be much more expensive, but it is more expensive. It's slower, and you're 100% dependent on whoever you get to build it for you. You have to find somebody good to build it. And even then, money cannot solve all problems. Not that I have enough money to have tried that, but some of the problems I tried to solve with money could not be solved with money because uh, they're still very busy. There's a lot of, uh, of, of business in the business, so they're used to hurrying, so they will hurry. 
even if you want them to slow down and do a good job. And still a lot of do as we usually do things. And there's pretty shitty building materials on the Danish market, even down to bricks, which these days have a lot of fly ash in them and stuff like that. Um, there are a few places you'll have to accept uh, materials which are suspect. For instance, the, the uh, ventilation barrier in the ceiling, either you can do it in concrete or you can do it in plastic. That's the only two options you have. And concrete is generally not what people want there. So if you want to build, this is what we did. Foundations 120 centimeters. Um, we uh, put foundations under all the interior walls to break up the resonance in the floor because we had the railroad that close on. I would at least put foundation under some of them because otherwise you have this one large con uh, concrete slab that can give you a resonance around one or two hertz, which is really annoying. Um, I didn't put plastic insulation under the, the uh, floor. I put liquor, uh, these ceramic things. I don't know what they're in, in English. Um, we put uh, floor heating in the, in the wooden layer, not uh, into the concrete, because in the wooden layer it regulates much faster, which is important when you have a well-insulated house. Um, no plasterboard at all. Uh, they come with built-in um, fungi spores, from the factory because the cardboard, they use the second-hand cardboard, which has been behind the supermarket for a month before it gets driven away. Um, we built heavy inner, inner walls, light concrete is called, um, half density of normal concrete. That helps a lot on the thermal stability and it helps a lot on the noise uh, stabilization. Try to avoid interior walls with a stabilizing for the house because you can't move them afterwards. Um, make uh, acoustic ceilings in large rooms, not wooden uh, ceilings, but uh, some acoustic damping material. We use something called Trolltect, which is sort of like hay dipped into concrete slurry. Um, the under roof, under, the, under your ceiling tiles, you have a roof when your tiles break. Normally that's just a plastic foil. Avoid that, they have 10 year lifetime. Um, Put down plywood with a tower on it, and then your, your ceiling tiles. Um, increase the dimension of your uh, ventilation above the legal minimum. You will need it. And make sure you have active bypass. And put a lot of electrical outlets all over the place. You, you will get offered the bare minimum, and they will not be where you want them. For instance, these days we hang our televisions on the wall. You will want an outlet to feed that television somewhere near where you're going to hang it. Uh, we ended up costing seven, uh, 17 and a half to 18,000 corner per square meters. It's a little bit hard to make the math here because some of the rooms of my company and they have a different cost structure. Um, but that's the cost we ended up net is, is in that area. That's probably about 25% higher than what a standard housing company will offer you a house for. But you get a lot for that. 25% extra money in, in building quality. I believe the house we built will last for at least 100 years, which makes it a lot more ecologically sound than having to scrap it in 30 years. And most of all, the company you get to build your house, if you hear anything negative about them, don't go with that company. Find a company that nobody's going to criticize. Or the only thing you can accept they criticize them for is they're very busy. We were very lucky. We found a local company. We couldn't find anybody who would say anything nasty about them. To the extent that when we had the contract, I went to the lawyer. The first thing the lawyer said, you love this. They built my house too. Um, I can highly recommend them. The bad news is they only built down in our end of Zealand. They won't come to Copenhagen. Um, so the Sherlock Holmes internet thing, anybody has a solution? Yeah? Nope. Nope. That's not it. Uh, so the problem is the head end spits out a lot of app packets all the time to see if people turned off their modems and blah, blah, blah. And the switch only has one MAC table. It doesn't have a MAC table per VLAN. 
So it will see the head and come in on two interfaces. So when you ping from the outside, the packet comes in and it sees the head end on interface one, and you send the response back on interface one almost immediately from your firewall. So the MAC address entry is still the right place. When you send the ping packet out, it takes 34 milliseconds before the reply comes back. And there's a 50 chance that the MAC table says it's on the other one now. So it will send out your packet through the wrong modem and the head end will reject it. And apparently, a lot of switch chips only have one MAC table and it's not per VLAN. Um, this was a particular Atheros chip. And uh, yeah, mm, oh, yeah, I guess we should have done it that way. Um, the solution for us was that we moved, the, um, we moved one of the modems down to the house instead using the, uh, the coax cable. So that solved the problem for us. But it's the weirdest network problem I've had in at least 15 years, having different ping losses in different directions. That one took me some time to figure out. Questions? We probably have two minutes for them. Did you use your company uh, firm for heating? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a very long story. Okay. But basically, I ended up talking to a senior officer in the uh, in a Kistuelsen who explained to me that, that we have these rules because we have these rules, and we have to follow these rules. So the easiest thing you can do is build two houses right next to each other. Because the heat generated in my company has not paid the same energy tax as the heat inside the house. So if any of that heat leaks into the house, that would be tax fraud. <laughs> so basically, I have an exterior wall between the company rooms and the rest of the house. I have a wall this thick inside the house because of this. So strictly speaking, every time I open the door, I commit tax fraud. This is utterly insane. But it's nothing compared to what it took to get the sewers done for the house, but that's an entirely different... <laughs> no more questions? Okay. There's a follow-up on that. So could, could your company own the property and uh, your family rent from the company? Uh, yes, that, that would be perfectly legal. Uh, and generate a lot of paperwork and make no difference at all at the end. Okay, no, also not for the heating because it's a, the, the no, I would still the have, tenant. No, I would still have to, uh, to install heating meter on the hot air leaking through the door. Mm, because that's going to a tenant. And, in, in, and, Denmark, yeah. in Denmark, we have both kinds of lawmaking, both taxes and fees. Um, it's just stupid. It's plain stupid. It okay. means you can have a supermarket dumping a lot of heat from their, from their cooling facilities, and you have a bunch of apartments upstairs burning electricity to heat their apartments. And they can't reuse it because tax reasons. Okay, let's give a big round of applause for Paul Henning.